Thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. Uh, this is the first of a series that we're organizing called Socialist Solutions to Pressing Problems. And it's co-sponsored and organized by my campaign for governor, along with GLE for lieutenant governor, the Green Party, the International Socialist Organization, and the Socialist Party USA here in New York City. And we thought it was important to begin framing the kind of issues and the problems we have in New York uh, in terms of socialist solutions, since the word socialism is now a conversation starter, not a conversation stopper. For somebody like me that grew up in the McCarthy era and the Cold War, you know, the word socialism just, you know, people said, oh, I know what you're talking about. I don't want to talk about it. Now it's like, yeah, socialism, what is it? It's become, uh, in one poll, 57% of enrolled Democrats think they like socialism. Majority of millennials do. Um, but what is it? And I think that's one of the reasons for having this forum. And also talk about, or this series of forums, and talk about uh, how socialist policies can actually address real solutions to these problems. So <clears throat> this is the first of a series. Next week in the same spot, we're going to talk about education. On uh, October 16th, segregation. We're the most segregated state in the nation, believe it or not, both housing and schools. That'll be in the Brooklyn Commons. Uh, the next day, there'll be a forum on health care up in the Bronx in one of the hospitals up there where you still haven't got it nailed down. Uh, housing, again, at the Brooklyn Commons, October 22nd. And there are other panels in the works on the topics of Puerto Rico, Palestine, and the climate crisis. So keep an eye out for that. And we had hoped to have Rick Wolf here today with us, but he woke up this morning with a virus and was losing his voice. So we may have him on one of the future panels or do a live stream with him. You know, he wants to help out, but he just was not in a position to do so today. So who we have here is I'm Howie Hawkins, the Green Party candidate for governor, which I didn't say at the beginning. I assume we all know that. Um, to my left is Joanne Lum, who's been an organizer with worker centers for the last 30 or so years and uh, just a top notch organizer and worker advocate. And to my right is Tana Forrester, who is a labor lawyer. She's a member of the Socialist Party USA. I know she's been doing a lot of work with immigrant workers. And so what we want to do for format is uh, I'll give my best Rick Wolf impersonation and, and try to cover some of the ground I would have had him cover about why capitalism delivers low wages. Um, and then, uh, but it'll be shorter and less detailed and knowledgeable or uh, scholarly as he might do. He's a professor of economics. And then Joanne and, and Tana are going to share their thoughts on the problem of low wages and their experiences in fighting uh, in the trenches for low wage workers. And then I'll wrap up with a few of the things we're pushing in my campaign to address the problem of low wage workers. So to begin with, what I wanted Rick to do is talk about why capitalism can't pay good wages, and particularly why wages haven't been going up since they, you know, they grew with productivity between World War II and the early 70s. And since then, wages have actually declined. The median wage is a dollar less than it was in 19, January 1973. It was 23 60-something then. It's 22 60-something now in real terms. Meanwhile, productivity has skyrocketed, and uh, it's over doubled in that time. And that's why the rich are getting richer and the rest of us are struggling to make ends meet. So if you quantify it, and it's controversial because it involves the labor theory of value, um, but that's just how much labor time goes into what's being produced. And uh, what you find is that about half of what workers produce is taken by a tiny elite of capitalists. And the workers are left with a fixed wage. And it's interesting when you think about, you know, property rights in the early part of this country, early period of this country, you know, the idea of Republican liberty was founded on you have your own property. You're not dependent on a slave master or uh, as an indentured servant on a master. You have your own tools in a trade or you have your own piece of land to farm. And that, that's what gives you the independence to be a free citizen and participate in a democracy. And uh, what has happened what began to happen in like the 1830s was people were, production was getting on a larger scale, factories, people were being pushed off the farms, 
Uh, the trades couldn't compete with factory manufacturing, and so they were going into the factories. And here in New York, the first workers' party in the world happened in Pennsylvania, was launched the Working Men's Party. They, they elected the president of the Carpenters Union to the uh, state assembly that year. They soon fell apart, but you know, it was the beginning of a number of third parties that had significant influence. And what they realized was, uh, they called it wages slavery, very consciously comparing to the situation in the South with the slaves, um, because they were no longer managing their own work, and they were dependent on somebody else for work and income. So they were no longer free in that you know, early Republican sense of freedom. And so they said, we need cooperative production if the uh, scale of production is going to be on a larger scale. So what was beginning to happen then in capitalism is that you do not get the full fruits of your labor, as they would put it back then. And that's basically why the rich get richer and the rest of us struggle to make ends meet. And it's called exploitation. And, you know, Marx elaborated the labor theory of value more than, uh, you know, Adam Smith and Ricardo had talked about it. Uh, but through that whole period, the classical political economists, their whole thing was, uh, We've got to get rid of the uh, rent share class, the landlord class, which was charging rent and interest and making unearned labor. And unfortunately, today, that sector now is about 40% of all profits. So we're kind of a mix of feudalism and industrialism. And, and you know, those classical economists thought the industrialists would, would get rid of those landlords and, uh, you know, financial renters you know, earning economic rents, which is basically unearned income. And in fact, they've merged. So you get people like Trump, you know, a real estate capitalist. Um, so one thing, the way to think about it is you had a slave mode of production. The slave owner obviously took the surplus that the slave produced. You had feudalism or tributary modes of production all over the world where the landlord uh, got the surplus of what the peasant produced. In capitalism, the capitalist gets the surplus of what the worker produces. But in socialism, the worker in the whole community appropriates that extra value over above what you need for subsistence and decides the best way to dispose of it. How much for personal consumption, how much for uh, collective consumption or public goods and services. And so that's a democratic economic system. And so that's what we're talking about with socialism. Now the question comes up, why did we gain wages in the so-called golden age of capitalism? Why did the wages keep pace with productivity? And we seem to be advancing there from really World War II right up to the early 70s. And I can't lay this out like an economist might, but the way I think about it, there's a political reason and an economic reason. The political reason is capitalism concentrates wealth and concentrated economic power translates into concentrated political power. So they have imposed uh, this freeze on wages because they can politically, and they can buy the politicians and not just control the politicians by campaign contributions, but they can withhold credit from a government. Like, you remember Dennis Kucinich, the boy mayor of Cleveland, kept his promise he wouldn't privatize the municipal utility, and the banks that wanted to privatize it said, oh yeah, we're pulling your line of credit. And because you know the tax revenues were fluctuating, he couldn't make payroll. He was bankrupt. Kucinich was in exile for 20 years. They weren't able to privatize it because we had a super inflation right after he got thrown out of office. And Cleveland looked back 20 years later and realized Kucinich had saved them a couple hundred million dollars in rates compared to what the suburban private utility was charging. Um, but at the time, the capitalists, you know, they, they dictated to Kucinich what would, what would happen. Um, and then the other thing capital can do is strike. When, when Clinton came in, he had a very modest reform program of middle class tax cuts and some investment in education and infrastructure. And Robert Rubin from Goldman Sachs and the uh, head of the Federal Reserve uh, Greenspan at that time said, no, you can't do that because Wall Street wants a balanced budget, fiscal austerity, or they won't invest to get you out of the Bush recession. So Clinton very famously said, you mean the future of my economic program and my reelection depends on the Federal Reserve and a bunch of effing bond, bond traders. And according to uh, 
Bob Woodward in a, a book where this quote appears, you know, Clinton was pissed. He was red-faced, is, is the way Woodward put it. So that's all outside elections. It's even more than campaign contributions. And that's the concentrated power. So they have been able to, since the 70s, uh, hold the line on workers' wages and actually bring them down a little bit on average and exploit the bottom layers extremely uh, more than before. And so that's a political reason. The economic reason is we're very productive. We can overproduce. And when you're paying the workers less, they can't afford to buy the uh, produce. So businesses don't expand and create jobs. They uh, tend to get into financial uh, manipulations, you know, mergers, acquisitions, stock buybacks. And one of the things the capitalists with all the power have done is got tax breaks, high-end tax breaks. This has been done by both parties. And that, in theory, they take that money and they invest it in new business and it trickles down to the rest of us as jobs and income. But because there isn't that demand, because the workers don't have much money, they instead buy more assets and further concentrate who owns the wealth we have. So they're not creating new productive wealth, they're just further concentrating and rearranging the wealth we've got. And uh, that's how you end up with 40% of all profits now in the economy being financialization. That's the fictional economy as opposed to the real economy of producing goods and services. Of course, that builds bubbles and we have you know, bus, booms and busts on that. Um, but that's what's been going on and I think that explains why uh, we have not had wages grow along with productivity. One is the capitalists have the power and the other is the economic system. We, we have overproduction. And that's the classic problem of capitalism because it does generate a lot of, uh, it is productive in terms of output per hour, productivity. And it gets so productive uh, and they don't want to pay the capitalists, I mean the workers, so there's a contradiction there and, and we end up with stagnation and concentration of wealth. And so then the question becomes, what can we do about it? And, and uh, all of us are going to speak to that. I would just say generally that we have uh, three things we got to do. We got to strengthen labor's right to organize and defend itself. Secondly, we got to push for the government uh, to have high labor standards. And uh, starting with the minimum wage, it creates a floor on the labor market if we want to get wages up. And then the socialist solutions are to start doing the things that build a socialist mode of production, cooperatives in the private sector and making our public services and agencies and enterprises in the public sector democratic. Because they're not democratic like NYCHA. You know, a lot of people make money off the contractors, the tenants don't have anybody on the board, and NYCHA's been, dis besides the disinvestment, you know, you got lead, mold, elevators don't work, the boilers don't work, the roofs leak, you know, it's been neglected. So if we control our public uh, enterprises and agencies, then they can serve our interests. So I'm going to stop there uh, with just that outline and, and then maybe come back to some more specific policies we're advocating in the campaign. But uh, I think we'll have Joanne speak next about what she's been doing and some of the issues around low wages that uh, she's been fighting. So go ahead. Thank you, Howie. Um, so as Howie mentioned, I have worked uh, for a number of years with a couple independent worker centers uh, based here in New York City, like NMAS. And these are cross-trade, you know, workers of all different kind of industries, um, all different kind of races, so coming together around workplace issues, but also issues in the community where people live. Uh, so, oh, thank you. Um, so since we're, uh, talking tonight about socialist solutions uh, to the low-wage epidemic. It seems to me that socialists have abandoned a key battle that was fought like a century and a half ago uh, that really spoke to the core of this problem and the reality of working people's lives. And that was the fight for the eight-hour day back. You remember then? <laughs> um, that, and so I feel like today, 150 years later, this is something that we should, it's the right moment to take up this fight, this fight for the right to a 40 hour work week. And the reason I say that is that 
we're seeing the, all these divisions uh, fueled among workers. There's more scapegoating going on, discrimination, unscrupulous employers are taking advantage of Trump's immigrant bashing and fear-mongering to exploit, extract more from immigrants and workers of color especially. Um, now workers around the country are being pitted against one another to survive. Everyone's struggling to survive. So some are working long hours, some can't get employment or are underemployed. Wages are dropping, people are developing more health problems as a result, there's more stress. Uh, and meanwhile, elected officials and state and national campaigns have succeeded in getting the minimum wage increased. Uh, but the lack of enforcement of the labor law has really spurred more wage theft, actually, so that a lot of workers uh, are not getting the minimum wage, and they have to scramble even more to make ends meet. So wealth inequality has widened even more. So it seems like it's time for us to take what we inherited from like this revolutionary past and build upon it, go beyond it. We need to get at what working people are facing right now. Um, the long work hours and how it promotes greater wage disparity, wealth disparity, and greater unemployment. Every day, I'm seeing workers who are struggling like this, working so many hours, or shut out of employment, or not being paid for the caregiving work that they do. So we see, for example, busboys being paid $3.25 an hour. This is New York City. And then having tips you know, kept by their employer on top of that. We see home attendants who are working 24-hour shifts in their patients' homes and who are paid for only 13 of those hours, 11 hours for free. A lot of people, like what um, Howie was just mentioning just now, are proposing solutions like raising the minimum wage or forming co-ops, cooperatives. We've, we have tried some of this in some of the groups that I've worked with, or individuals I've worked with. For instance, uh, a worker-owned restaurant in Queens, uh, land trust, uh, housing cooperatives in Lower East Side of Manhattan. Co-ops are defensive measures. They're survival mechanisms, but I don't think they're the solution. Because raising the minimum wage and forming co-ops are about <clears throat> economic survival. They, they help certain sectors of workers, but they don't really get at the political system. They don't really challenge the political system. They don't really help raise working class consciousness or really help to unite the working class. So for instance, raising the minimum wage is good. Of course, we need that, but it leaves out all the workers who don't get minimum wage. You know, so like a lot of the people that we see who don't even get the current minimum wage, and so raising it just means more wage theft, actually, if there's no enforcement. So pushing for reforms in a reformist way actually kind of strengthens the system because it makes people feel like the system's not so bad. We can, we can make it less, you know, more humane, not so cruel. So what would building a movement for the eight hour day, the right to an eight hour day, what would that look like if we you know, tried to do it in not a reformist way? We, do, we need to engage working people in addressing their immediate needs because people really are struggling, right? Struggling to survive. But we need to do it in a way that develops the working class leadership and like a way to connect our day-to-day -day with the long-term long vision, our long-term goals. So I'd like to share an example of one of the campaigns that I'm involved in right now that is about fighting for control of our time, and that's the 
Ain't I a Woman campaign, which Howie actually has supported. Um, in the last few years, we've been seeing a lot of home attendants, home care workers coming, coming to us. Um, in New York, 93% of these home care workers are women. Most are immigrants, um, women of color. And many of these home attendants are taking care of patients in their homes for 24 hours because it's medically needed. Like a lot of these patients are bedridden or they have Alzheimer's or they you know, need assistance through the night being turned over or going to the bathroom. Home attendants aren't allowed to leave their patient's side for that 24-hour shift. And some workers work four days, five days, six days in a row, 24 hours. The New York State Department of Labor just last um, fall issued an emergency regulation about these 24-hour shifts. These regulations basically undermine the wage law that was established uh, last year when three New York State courts said, they ruled that if you're a home attendant working 24-hour shift in a patient's home, you have a right to be paid for all 24 hours that you work, because you're working. But the Labor Department's regulations allow the employers to avoid, avoid this. They can get around it. They have to, and they can force the home attendants to prove that you didn't sleep at night, to be able, like at least five hours without interruption in order to be paid. Home attendants are saying that these regulations of our government, our state government, are creating conditions for a modern, modern day slavery because it, they force workers to work day and night without pay for the night. This is like beyond wage exploitation it's not enough that the women be paid for every single hour of the 24 hours, right? Because that's, that's still it's crazy, 24 hours or days on end. I mean, and so just calling for the pay is not enough. That's like, okay, getting overtime pay after 40. It doesn't address the time issue, the control of time. Because these women working 24-hour shifts they can't sleep, they can't go home, they can't see their families, they can't take care of their health. Their, their physical, mental health breaks down. Already, and the DLL regulations basically kind of support the home care industry to continue doing this, um, cheating the workers and forcing these 24-hour shifts. Already, with um, the threats to DACA program. I remember uh, executives from home care agencies freaking out. They were saying, what are we gonna do if, you know, because many of the home care workers have DACA and they see it as a source of cheap labor. Now the industry also says, if we have to pay home care workers for all 24 hours that they work, this is gonna bankrupt the industry. I mean, it sounds very reminiscent of the white elite and the elected officials justifying slavery, right? Like, what are we going to, this is going to cause the demise of the plantation economy, the American economy, if there's no more slavery in this country. The home attendants who are involved in this fight to prohibit 24-hour shifts, they're helping to send a message actually that none of us should be forced to work overtime, forced to work overtime. Because a lot of people, I mean the home care workers face this extreme conditions, but a lot of us are working longer and longer hours in all kinds of work, right? You take your work home, the computer, you're texting, you're working on the weekends, on vacation even, right? I mean it's like without limit. So Right now, I feel like we have a chance to gain some control over our time. I mean, it is a little crazy that we're fighting now for 12-hour shifts instead of 24 in the home care industry. 
I mean, we're going backwards. I mean, it was like fight for the eight hour day 150 years ago. Now it's like 12 is like something, you know, <laughs> really good. Uh, but if we can unite to, to take this first step of getting rid of the 24 hour shifts, workers will have more time to take care of their health, see their families, be at home, develop themselves, uh, have more of a life. And it also means that other home care workers might have a chance to be employed. Because, you know, 24, that's a lot. You work four days, 24 hours, what's that, 96 hours. That's two, two people's jobs there. And fighting for control of our time would help unite the working class also, because it's just cross-trade, right? And it's also not just the people forced to work long hours, but the people shut out of employment, un unemployed. Because right now, at a time when people are so divided and pitted against one another, we need to find that way to unify. We're all struggling to survive, you know, both immigrants and citizens. And this has been going on. The divisions, the pitting against one another has gone on before Trump. I mean, especially in the 80s, really took a hard downturn. And one key factor was an anti-worker, anti-immigrant uh, provision called employer sanctions, which was part of the 1986 immigration bill, you know, um, passed under Ronald Reagan. This is the provision that basically criminalized immigrants. It created an underclass in our country, like a class of workers, undocumented, you have no rights. And so that's why undocumented workers can be super exploited now, abused. And that's why we're pitted against one another, immigrant against citizen, and then our wages and conditions go down for all of us. So this bill was not just anti-immigrant, is anti-worker, really has divided the working class. So in response to a lot of these anti-immigrant attacks these days, a lot of people are calling for sanctuary or amnesty or papers for dreamers. I feel like it's, we need to go beyond these, these defensive measures also. We need to kind of be more proactive, like we need to come together, we need to unite workers to say no more criminalization of immigrants, no more underclass, right? That we need to fight together for equal rights for all workers, get rid of this, this slave law, this modern day slave law employer sanctions. because. If we can let people see what the employer sanctions bill does, you know, it will let them see what this, the nature of the system. I mean, the system, just like black codes, you know, around the time of Reconstruction South, when it was used to force freed black slave back onto the plantation. If we can join people to see how employer sanctions is doing something like that with us, abusing some and then, and then dividing us, pitting us against one another. It lets people see how, how the system really works to exploit all of us, to get the most out of all of us. So Trump has brought a lot of people out searching for solutions and also some of our local elected officials too, right? bringing a lot of us out to search for alternatives. So I feel like it's more important now than ever to unite the working class so that we can minimize the power of the, of the bourgeois right, um, you know, have workers gain more control over our time, our work, our health, our communities, and this way, lay groundwork for more fundamental change. So I hope we can work together to do this. Thank you. So I'm Tana Forrester. Uh, I am the chair of the New York City local of the Socialist Party. 
Uh, and I'm, as Howie mentioned, I'm also a workers' rights attorney. Uh, Joanne uh, touched on several of the things that I would like to talk about today. Uh, mainly, there are many ways in which both the Democratic and Republican Party um, use the labor laws as, as a weapon to disempower workers and um, uh, strengthen and protect the capitalist class. So many people think, oh, you know, the, the Democrats in comparison to the Republicans, they're, they're not so bad or somehow they're the lesser of two evils. But um, as a socialist and a member of the Socialist Party, I would point to several ways in which uh, that is not true. And we can see that in New York State and New York City today. Uh, the law that Joanne mentioned previously, ERCO, was a, you know, a strongly supported bipartisan bill, which basically created an underclass of workers. This wasn't something that was put forth by, you know, just some sort of evil, nefarious Republicans, but actually had a lot of support from both, like, the Democratic Party and, um, you know, uh, bourgeois labor leaders that work in cahoots with the Democratic Party. Uh, they made it so that uh, workers who were, uh, you know, working with without papers, they created this category where people, um, you know, needed papers to work, but the the paper authorization was used against the workers. It wasn't something that was used to to punish employers for, uh, you know, em employing people who were here unlawfully. Instead, uh, this law was actually used as a way to intimidate and control workers and also drive down the wages for both um, people who are here lawfully and people who are here unlawfully. It, it created uh, sinking conditions for all workers and this is something that was supported in a bipartisan way and still uh, remains uh, something that neither Republicans nor Democrats are willing to fight against. Uh, it's also um, just the entire system of labor laws when when uh, workers actually seek to enforce them they find themselves at the mercy of a judiciary which uh, almost always enforces the laws in the favor of the bosses so if you bring a wage theft case in court if you've been you know working for sub minimum wages or you've been misclassified you're working overtime or and not getting time and a half. It's like par for the course that the way that your case will be handled by the sitting judge is that you will be pressured very hard to take uh, a very small amount of money just to settle your case. And the overwhelming majority of cases, something over over 92 percent of cases settle, and workers are left maybe with getting you know uh, a percentage of their back wages but they're when you go in front of a judge at these conferences the idea and the case the case law and the motivation um, of these judges is to you know make the workers settle make them be happy for even getting a partial amount of their wages it's the, the system is so heavily skewed uh, towards the employers that um, even getting like uh, minimal satisfaction for what you're actually owed is supposed to be seen as a victory when in fact it's just um, it's just more wage theft it's state sanctioned wage theft Joanne mentioned um, the DOL and um, how after the home care workers won their victory in court, um, the DOL in, 
in conjunction with the home care industry uh, sought to rewrite the laws and sought to make it so that um, home care workers would continue not to be paid for all their hours worked. That's not the only instance that the uh, Department of Labor um, you know, supports wage theft. The way in which they investigate uh, instances of wage theft is both uh, very, it's very sloppy. Um, if, if a worker experiences wage theft, many times the investigations are done, the employers are tipped off beforehand, they're able to um, hide their violations, and um, the investigators just do kind of like a quick run through and um, nothing really happens to them. The enforcement is very lax. When people uh, go to the Department of Labor with their complaints, very often they're pressured to settle for pennies on the dollar. And um, that's something that is controlled by the executive branch um, in New York State, which is controlled by the Democratic Party. But still, there's this some sort of illusion that the Democratic Party is um, somehow more in favor of workers' rights or immigrants' rights. But um, that does isn't really borne out by the experience of many workers uh, with these state enforcement bureaus. Um, uh, another way in which um, workers who actually seek to use the um, judicial system to uh, get access to the money that they're owed, another way in which they are uh, you know, stopped is that even if they win a judgment, uh, the, the laws of New York State make it very difficult if uh, someone declares bankruptcy for workers to actually collect on, on what they're owed. And uh, many, many groups, uh, including NMAS and others, have been working at something called the sweat bill, but that has languished in, in the uh, legislature. And this bill would actually make it something very simple. It, it would make it so that workers could, could collect the judgments that they're owed, but um, it just can't seem to get passed, even though it seems as if it's a popular idea. People should be, if, if someone has a judgment, if someone is able to, to prove that uh, money was stolen from them by their bosses, uh, it, it should be a pretty simple task and a pretty popular task for them to be able to collect the money that they're owed. But uh, it, it, hasn't, it hasn't passed and it's been introduced, I think, maybe for, I don't know how many years, but several years. Three, maybe? Three, three years, and it, it just can't, can't seem to uh, get passed. Um, another uh, popular line that uh, the Socialist Party um, really wants to dispel is that, well, it's actually kind of two lines. Um, it's that immigrants do the jobs that Americans don't want to do, and the flip side of that is that um, immigrants steal jobs from Americans. Uh, those are just kind of two sides of the same coin that um, kind of pit workers against each other. It, it leaves the, the question of, of the bosses completely off the table and just, um, you know, makes this conflict between immigrants and uh, citizen-born workers without actually questioning why is it that conditions are so bad, why is it that pay is so low, why is it that people have to work longer and longer hours. It leaves, it leaves the question of the bosses and the question of the state completely out of it. And this is something uh, that for too long in, in politics has been the norm. There's no, there's no, uh, analysis of why is it that both of the major parties are 
at the service of employers. Why isn't there a party in the United States that is for uh, the majority of people, for the working class? It's just completely accepted that the workers will have to just suck it up and you know, take paltry reforms while um, the Democrats and the Republicans attempt to curry favor with various business interests. Uh, Joanne and Howie touched on a lot of the historical points that I was going to make, so <laughs> I'm not going to um, repeat them, but there, I do agree that this, this is a time when it would be very beneficial for um, workers of, in all different industries, not just people who are making minimum wage or below minimum wage, but workers in industries where they can, you know, in comparison, maybe some people think that they're doing pretty good, that, that the people could uh, get together, recognize themselves as workers and recognize that neither of, neither the Republicans nor the Democrats represent their interest and that these reforms are um, that are, are being put forth are not actually going to address the problem, the problem of people's time, problem of control over your workplace, the problem of control over society. Um, many, most people don't see themselves represented uh, in the choices that they're offered. Uh, the majority of people don't or can't vote. Um, so I think that there's a time right now where, you know, there's a recognition that there's a problem and uh, that, and as Howie mentioned, socialism doesn't seem to be quite uh, such a, a dirty word anymore, although there is a lot of confusion about what exactly it means. You know, perhaps we're living in a moment in which uh, people will reject the two capitalist parties and uh, seek to build uh, a mass socialist party. Okay. Thank you, Tana and uh, Joanne. What I want to do now is just lay out some of the platform planks that we are promoting in this campaign. And uh, some of them are basically aimed at uh, strengthening worker organizing, defending worker interests, and then some are transformative in trying to set up socialist forms of production. So the minimum wage, that's something that we've campaigned on, $15 minimum wage in 2015. And Cuomo, uh, we got 5% of the vote. He was trying to roll up his vote, wanted to run for president. 5% is the most any independent third parties ever got except two socialist candidates in 1918 and 1920. Third party for governor on the left in New York, except for uh, these socialists in 1918 and 1920 who got 5.6 and 5.7 percent. So that's significant and, and Cuomo saw that and he had to say, well, what were these people talking about? How do I compete for those votes? He couldn't take us for granted. And we got a ban on fracking, we got paid family leave. He's talking about a $15 minimum wage. In fact, he's running around the state like we got it. You don't even have it in the city till the end of this year. In the suburbs, they won't get it till uh, where, 2021? In upstate, we get to 1250 in 2021, then they'll look at it again. Right now, it's 1040, it's still a poverty wage. So what we're calling for is 20 by 20 and 30 by 30. If the minimum wage in 1968 had kept place with inflation and productivity, it would be, uh, 29.43, uh, at least a couple of months ago when I made that calculation. 29.43, and now it's 10.40 in New York, federally it's 7.25. I mean, that's where at the low end of the labor market, uh, people have got behind. We're producing more than ever for the hours we put in, and we're not getting the reward for that. So I think we need to keep pushing the minimum wage, but as Joanne points out, you gotta make sure it's enforced. You know, employers, it, you, ha you see it a lot in the, uh, you know, the restaurant industry, the home health aid industry, temporary 
uh, labor agencies, people get hired by contractors to haul stuff, landscape, construction, and then when payday comes, they're gone. The job is over. They're gone. You can't even find them. They just stole those people's labor. That happens all the time. But even it happens in corporations. I had it happen to me at UPS, and I wouldn't take no for an answer. I put in, you got it wrong. It was a Sunday. I was supposed to get time and a half, and they stole an hour from me. And so when, when I got the correction, they just put that hour in on straight time. I said, no. Supervisor said, well, I'm not going to do it again. And I said, I'm going to grieve you. He said, go ahead. And then I told the younger guys, uh, start checking your time clocks. Uh, write down your times and then see what you get at the end of the week. And it turns out these supervisors were shaving five or ten minutes off every shift for these young guys. So we put in another grievance. And it turns out upper management had problems with these guys. They were changing their numbers. You know, they got to report to upper management. And uh, they wanted to make their numbers look good. Turns out they were snorting cocaine. That's why they were crazy when they come out with supervisors, acting like madmen, like drill instructors. And uh, they were doing a lot of other stuff. So the day they were perp walked out by sheriff's deputies was the day we got our double back pay. Best day ever at UPS. But well, that's all to say it's, uh, in fact, I just wrote an article. It's in a, it's a publication that uh, these people in Brooklyn, they're uh, Caribbean immigrants have a Workers' World Today online publication, and they got a uh, paper edition out sometimes. And I, I wrote about uh, wage theft there. And uh, when I was doing the research, there's a group called Good Jobs First. They did some research on this. Uh, the biggest wage theft uh, company is Walmart. Um, some of the names there are Bank of America, Allstate Insurance. FedEx was the second biggest competitor of UPS. I mean, it's corporate America, not just the, you know, people on the margins of the economy. So this is a huge problem. In New York, it's $1 billion a year. That's the estimate. And the Department of Labor brags about recovering $22 million a year. I think that's the settlements, not the money that the workers actually get, which is why we want this sweat law that we were talking about that needs to pass. That enables the workers who get a judgment to have a lien against the assets of the employer and be able to go to court and get that money if the employer doesn't provide the back wages. So that's another reform we can fight for. Remember card check? You know, Obama promised it. That was one of his uh, yes we can uh, planks in, in 2008. And once they were elected, the Democrats, you know, later for that. Card check means when a majority of workers sign up at a workplace that they want a union to represent them in bargaining, uh, it, they are recognized. Majority get that's the bargaining union, and then if the employer doesn't uh, bargain in good faith, the, the the bargaining union can demand arbitration to get that first contract. That would help, uh, you know, people organize so they have union protection. Another thing that we're proposing is it's called just cause. Most of Europe, you cannot be terminated without a just cause. It has to be a business-related reason that you're not doing the job. Uh, you're not meeting the job's requirements or the business can't afford to keep the employers. They just can't fire you at will because, you know, now the cousin needs a job and they don't need you because, you know, the boss's cousin or nephew needs a job, that kind of thing. Or because some other people are willing to work cheaper than you are. Um, <clears throat> so they have it in Montana of all states. It's the only state in the union. So that requires, you know, just cause for termination. We can raise the minimum wage by wage uh, sectoral bargaining. That's how the fast food workers got to 15. Cuomo can convene a wage board and negotiate, bring the, the labor side, the business side, and the government side together and figure out what's a fair wage in that industry. And that can help regulate some of the extreme exploitation in some of these sectors, particularly like the home health care or home attendant er area, some of the retail areas, and farm workers. So that's something the governor has the power to do. Uh, Joanne mentioned the 24-hour shifts. That should just be illegal. And people should be paid overtime when they get to 40 hours on these, uh, you know, if they're doing the home attendant, you know, say there were 12-hour shifts. You know, after the, by the middle of the fourth day, um, you're on overtime for that week. That needs to be uh, enforced. And it's just, you know, pretty, pretty bad when uh, Cuomo's Department of Labor, there are three straight court rulings saying this is illegal, and they cite a federal case somewhere else to justify the regulation, and now these uh, 
home attendants are back now, I guess, in federal court, right? The, they're back in state court. Um, it's kind of like Andrew Jackson telling the Supreme Court, you know, enforce your damn law about the Cherokee, and he just took the Cherokee off to Oklahoma to trail of tears because the Supreme Court didn't have an army. That's the kind of arrogance we're getting from the Cuomo administration. It sounds very Trumpian, but uh, that's where we're at, particularly when it comes to workers. Labor law protections are not extended to farm workers or prisoners, who prisoners work for 60 to 20 cents an hour. So these are all things that, you know, a pro-worker governor could promote and pro-worker legislators. You know, if we had an independent socialist party, if it's the Green Party or a Socialist Party or some other thing we get together that's bigger, uh, could be an independent force in politics, could speak up for these things. Right now, uh, we get, you know, some legislators to put legislation in, but then it doesn't get passed because, you know, both of the parties are really business parties. That's who funds their, their campaigns. So they have some progressives, particularly the Democrats, but they're the tail on the donkey. So the other thing we can do is promote socialist forms of production. And, you know, we're calling our campaign for public health insurance, public health care, public housing, repairing what we got, expanding uh, so that we can create more affordable housing, the most cost effective way, public energy, so we can plan this transition to 100% clean energy in 2030 and also provide it at cost, not, you know, for public benefit rather than for the private profit of absentee owners. Public broadband, PS, the Public Service Commission said as a condition of the Time Warner merger and the charter, you had to build out the infrastructure to underserved areas. Now Time Warner is called Spectrum. They haven't done it, so Public Service Commission said to charter, sell it. We said the state should take it over and set up community broadband, which a Harvard study earlier this year said provides better service at lower cost. So the key thing about these public sector things, as I was saying earlier, they need to be democratic. Otherwise, you end up with abuse like we do in NYCHA, like we do with the New York Power Authority, which uh, provides its low power subsidies, not just to the municipals, we've got public power companies that do get favored uh, access to that hydropower on the St. Lawrence, um, and there are 50 of them in the state, these small municipal utilities, but so do industries. And, uh, you know, they get it, so, but it's political as to who gets chosen, you know, which factories, which companies. And uh, so if we have democratic accountability, we can avoid the favoritism and, and let everybody benefit. Um, and I think one model we need to look at for governing these public enterprises is something that really came out of the new left because they looked at, you know, nationalized industries. A bunch of them were nationalized in France and Britain after World War II. Uh, we actually nationalized 25% of our manufacturing during World War II and the mobilization to beat the Nazis. And then we gave it right back to the capitalists, even though the capitalists were getting nervous because between the workers and the managers, they didn't need the owners. They were like extra middlemen and they were wasting money. And uh, so they got real nervous and, and, you know, long story there, but anyway, they got their assets back. Um, but the problem in all these cases is, is the workers didn't have much of a say. The community didn't have much of a say. Um, so when we started looking at these things coming out of the 60s, uh, two models in particular. One was when the uh, Arab oil boycott embargo in 73 uh, during the Yom Kippur War, uh, you know, gas prices skyrocketed. The gas companies were actually hoarding the gas to, you know, jack up the price. Really created a problem in that 73, 74 recession which is, I think, the turning point from the post-war compromise where we're, wages were keeping up with productivity, and since then they haven't. They broke the back and scared the hell out of labor. I was, I was a worker then, and I remember it. Just the tone totally changed. But uh, there was a model of public power. It appeared in the congressional record, just to show you how things have changed. Uh, Jeff Fo and Lee Reb wrote it, and it was put there by Lee Metcalf, Democrat from Montana back in those days. And uh, Jim Ridgway and Len Rodberg were also writing about this. The books came out. And what it was was you'd have local power districts where uh, you had the boards elected by the public and the workers, two-thirds public, one-third workers. So the expertise, the workers were on the board, and the public you know, had the last say because that's who it was for. Uh, similar model with uh, a proposal for a national health service. 
Back in the 70s, the debate wasn't between single payer and employer mandates, or basically Obamacare and single payer today, what we call it. Back then it was Nixon's employer mandates. That became, through a lot of evolution, Obamacare. The middle position was Kennedy's National Health Insurance, which is a single payer insurance plan. And then the other one was the Dellums National Health Service, which would put doctors on salary under public you know, agencies like the National Health Service in the UK or a similar one in Denmark or, or Costa Rica or Cuba. And uh, they called, the radicals called the single payer insurance, what we call it today, the Great Leap Sideways. And it was actually written by Oliver Fine, who was a leader in the Physician for a National Health Plan now, and a guy named John Ehrenreich an article called The Great Leap Sideways. And what they were worried is that the private profit motivated uh, providers and insurance and, and drug companies would feed at the public trough of this insurance system. And you'd have cost control and not a responsive system. So the Dellums plan was written mainly by the uh, Medical Committee on Human Rights, which were the medics and doctors who serviced the civil rights and then any war movements patched people up after they got the billy club or the fire hose or whatever, you know, problem they had. And uh, I think that's the model we need to think about our public agencies. It's a bottom-up accountable system. So you have the local districts, they federate at the state level, the local districts elect that board, and then if you, at the national scale, a national board. Um, and then the worker co-ops. I think we need state banking, and it should have a division like the Monogon co-ops had that promotes the planning or promotes the worker co-ops through planning, technical assistance, and financing. And we build that sector out. And it's a learning experience for people that they can actually manage their own work. And uh, they get the full fruit of their labor. The more they contribute, the more the company does well, and the more wages, more really income, not wages, that they get. Um, but I think, and this is my last point, the most important thing said tonight was by Joanne in that you know, we need a revolutionary approach to this question that develops working class leadership. And we were talking earlier, I mean, my model f since I was a teenager was what happened uh, with the Mississippi Freedom Democrats when they went to the Chicago uh, Atlantic City Convention and were denied uh, seating and the, Dixie the segregationist Dixiecrats got it. And what happened there was you had a middle class, Harvard educated mathematician, Robert Moses, was the leader of SNCC, and he, he directed the Freedom Summer. But when they set up the Freedom Party, you know, everybody assumed he'd be the spokesperson. He said, no, the people here, the rank of files, got to elect their leader. And one of the leaders was Fannie Lou Hamer. And when the compromise came, Johnson sent the liberals, Hubert Humphrey and Walter Mondale and Joseph Rao, to tell the Freedom Democrats, you made progress. We're going to give you two honorary seats at large. You can wander around the convention, talk to people but we're going to seat the Dixiecrats. And Martin Luther King, by Rustin, said, take it. It's, you know, progress. They're, they're at least recognizing you. And so the Freedom Democrats met, and Fannie Lou Hamer said, you know, no. We didn't work all this way just for no two seats. And that's what happens when, you know, working class people speak for themselves. The middle class leadership, you know, they have relationships. They have... Uh, things to preserve. The working class people, you know, they got nothing to lose. And uh, th so they're not going to sell out. And that's why, to me, as we develop these, you know, campaigns to win these reforms, set up these co-ops, whatever it is, we've got to make sure that we do in a way that develops the leadership of working class people. Because in the end, you know, we have too many cases of, of NGOs, you know, people come right out of college, they're on the staff of the union, or they're working for the NGO. And, it's not the working class. In a corporate society, we got the owners, we got the professional managerial class, and the workers. And too much of our movement activity is run by a professional managerial class on the left. And, you know, the workers are props in that, in that setup too many times. So for me, that was, you know, I think the most important thing said here. So with that, um, let's open it up for question and answer and discussion. Sure.
pick out of the 30 people who've already made it to Glenn which one you like. And all these other people get nothing. So you've got this huge uh, internet economy that's generating jobs uh, internationally, and there's no international organization of workers at this point. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, I'm part of Freelancers Union, and Sarah, Thoughts on that? I mean, yeah, you're you're correct that the wages have been driven down. I mean, especially if you look at something like um, the way that Uber and Lyft have affected um, taxis and like the the value of medallions or just the what uh, drivers, the amount of money that the drivers can make. Um, I can't really speak to things like. Uh, like people who are working, doing piecemeal jobs uh, on the internet uh, with gig economy, but um, I do know that there are, there are people who are attempting to organize Uber drivers. I, I actually don't, I don't know what, how those workers could be organized. The ones that are just like, uh, for example, also writers, like people who write for, for blogs, uh, are also experiencing the same thing. Now they're having people pitch, pitch ideas or write sample stories. So the work has already been done. It is then it's submitted. They people create the content. It's submitted, and then, and then one of them gets paid. It's very, uh, I don't know that 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 type of work is. Um, it's, I'm sure uh, someone can think of a way to organize those workers, but it's almost like. It's a very different type of work because it's like work that's being performed without even the the promise of payment. Well, one one thought I have is, um, and you're you're talking about an industry I haven't really thought much about, but a lot of the temporary work. These temp agencies are really exploitative. They, uh, you know, you get in there and, you know, whoever goes to them for labor is, say, paying $20 an hour and you're getting $10 an hour. And there is some overhead that temp agency has to do, but the rest is profits for their investors. And uh, I think that's a place where you can have either a public ownership model or a cooperative ownership model. Public ownership might be community hiring hall. Uh, that a municipality could sponsor uh, for, I'm thinking that of temp agencies where, you know, people go out and do day labor um, or short jobs with factories, you know, uh, just upstate, you know, we've, we're rust belt, but actually the assemblies are coming back, kind of sweatshop conditions, and we have immigrants, a lot of them people, refugees uh, from the Middle East and Africa, I mean, we got them from all over, Asia, you know, various, all kinds of folks, and, uh, you know, I, there are people who work assembly line, and then they go out to UPS and work on, you know, a part-time night shift unloading trucks. And uh, it's, you know, I see the wear and tear and the injuries those people have. Um, so, and they get these factory jobs on temp. So I think either community agency or a worker co-op. We have a model here in the home health care industry in the Bronx, forget their name, but they have a cooperative. And uh, last time I looked there, Home health care people were uh, getting a better wage because there was less overhead that the agency was taking and better benefits. Um, and when you've got, and that brings people together in a form where they're not atomized like you were worried about, and, uh, you know, and as a unit they can bargain. The other thought I have on that is that I know in uh, northern Italy, uh, the Emiliano, 
Romagna area. There's a lot of co-ops, and a lot of them are technical, you know, engineers um, and small firms, and they're all in competition, but what they do is uh, they'll all put in bids, and one of them will get the general contract. We, you know, these are with big multinationals for various things that require manufacturing and, or design. And then the one will get the bid, but then the, the other guys will um, be subcontractors. So they, they cooperate. You know, they compete for the general contractor, but then they cooperate in finishing the job because they're all small. And it, it's sort of, from each job, you get a different group of people working together. So maybe that's another model to look at. Um, and that's, you know, that part of Italy has a lot of worker cooperatives. It's a uh, different, little different, and they've had support from uh, the regional government, which, you know, has been left wing, the Italian communists, and uh, I think that was the main party that's, you know, generated that support there. Oh, um, maybe if I could just add something. I think that the gig economy, it seems like it's part of this um, other trend or whatever, another way that employers exploit us. Like you mentioned misclassification, I think. Mm -hmm. A lot of more and more workers being misclassified and called independent contractors instead of employees. So then that, that lets the boss off the hook for a lot of things. And then it's connected to subcontracting too. Like all these ways that employers find to kind of distance themselves from the responsibility and then they can you know, abuse us more. And it also causes workers to less identify as workers. Like they become like independent contractor. I'm self-employed kind of thing. And so I think that that contributes also to less of a sense of a working class, you know? Because I really do think, and even for, like you mentioned, middle class, I mean, really, when you look at who, who consider, like, identifies as middle class now, people are struggling. Even people that were middle class, I mean, look at people's health care, you know, or the pensions, or everything is um, kind of under threat. Uh, and people working really longer hour, uh, hours, harder. Um, teachers, I mean, we're bigger classrooms working so hard. Um, they're middle class, but like I feel like we need to, we need to see ourselves as workers and being exploited, and try to find a way to identify who it is. You were saying there's no physical location, right? Uh, so that, that is challenging, but how do we get, come together to identify? You know, I know that <clears throat> before when there was more of a garment industry in this uh, city, in this country, we were organizing a lot of garment workers and going after, after the retailer um, manufacturers. So for instance, we went after uh, Donna Karen because of factories that she used, that she contracted to, where the workers weren't paid minimum wage, and in some cases, minimum, minimum wage, um, not just overtime. Anyway, and so she was trying to deny responsibility, saying, those aren't my employees. I contract out, and, but she's the one who set the, set the standards. So I need this done by this, and I need this work like this, and this is how much I'm going to give you, you know, and so, Legally, the law was sort of difficult to use to hold her responsible because you have to these things that you have to prove these standards. But politically, we were able to hold her responsible and to pay for some of the wages owed. Um, though she didn't want people to know. I mean, she didn't want it public. But anyway, I feel like we need to explore ways to do that as workers uh, because otherwise they just use that use that all against us to become like independent and separate.
I mean, it's actually very common when we do misclassification cases, speaking to uh, clients to kind of break through that idea because a lot of people have taken it on themselves. Like they know that they're being screwed over, but at the same time, they, they still kind of want to hold on to this idea that maybe somehow they are their own boss. But then when you really get to the uh, real question of control, that's something that actually, it's like who is controlling your working conditions? Who is, who is telling you what to do, when to work, you know, when you won't be working, how much you're going to get paid? And, and actually through, on, on a number of different cases in, in many different industries, sometimes when there is no physical location and people are just like customer service reps that are all over the country on the, like never meeting each other face to face, you can actually build solidarity uh, between workers once you break through that, but you know, as you've said, it's it is this this idea of it's it's a it's a this idea that you are your own boss somehow, even though you have virtually no control over any uh, for, like part of your working life. It it it's something that's really uh, it's taken hold, but it also when you point to the issue of of control and the similarity between you and other people. Um, you can start to build some sort of solidarity. Steve. But when we think about the turning point that, that Harry identified in the 70s, when the increase in productivity began to go into the pockets of the bosses rather than being reflected in wage increases, it seems to me that we need to surface one And that's the decline of the organized labor movement. Um, after World War II, the, the organized labor was a strong force in this country. And the, the unions, the CIO especially, had been built in the 1930s. And it represented the, the active organizing of the rank and file. Throughout the 50s and 60s, the unions became top heavy. Wage increases kind of felt like they were coming without a lot of struggle, and people got out of the habit of struggle. And the result was, at that moment in the 1970s, the start of the New York municipal crisis, um, there was a calculated, there was a calculation made by by the, the people at the top that now they could make a turn, they could start taking back. themselves at the rank and file level. And they've done a, a ton of things. I mean, this, this, you know, the, all of the ways that they make people um, dissociated from their reality of themselves as workers. And it, 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 it's on an international scale. It's not just uh, you know, in the United States, but the, the competition with other countries, etc. Somehow that the, the <coughs> element how do we unite, how do we make people understand that they have to unite and struggle? Um, or how, what's going to happen to make them? Because it's not so much us convincing them, it's the you know, life convincing them. But that, that whole element of the decline of the organized labor movement, which allowed this whole attack and has created the condition we're in now, I think is something that we need to, to surface and talk about. Yeah, I, I want to go back to that period and, and just point out, I should have done this in the presentation, is that the period from the 40s to the early 70s is anomalous. It's an exception to the history of capitalism. Those of us that came up in that period, I mean, I came out of Ivy League school and went, you know, took advantage of my shop classes in high school to get into construction because I liked it. But I thought I'd do better than it turned out you know, in, in blue collar work because of the experience of the 60s. And, you know, I heard a few Marxists saying, you know, this, it's not gonna last. 
My dad was no Marxist, but he grew up in the Great Depression, and he always told me that. But, you know, I was a little bit rebellious, and that I should have listened. And uh, it really did turn. And I think the reason is political. Um, you know, organized labor was strong, and there had been upheaval in Europe, and the capitalists were a little bit scared. And when the GIs came home, you know, they, MacArthur wanted to send the GIs in the Philippines and Okinawa over to China. And, you know, when the soldiers started hearing about that, they rebelled. They had arms. They said, we're not going. We won the war. We're going home. And, you know, it was like Vietnam. The soldiers stopped fighting. The army basically stopped fighting. And that's why Nixon had the Vietnamese to war. They were scared of the working class because they just fought. And when they're coming back here, I think, you know, the GI Bill was very generous historically. And I think that really was because they feared the working class. And, you know, then there was a strike wave right after World War II. Uh, because they hadn't, there'd been an agreement that some didn't like, but, but, you know, no strike during the war. So, you know, labor was trying to catch up for lost grounds, and so one of the biggest strike waves came right after the war. So that's why they compromised. And then, I think Steve's right, you know, the labor movement said, man, this is easy. We don't have to organize our own people. This is a controversial statement. I'm going to make it anyway, because I heard two old radicals. First National Green Gathering, Jimmy Boggs from Detroit, and Murray Bookchin, and they both had been auto workers, and I introduced them to each other. Uh, they'd never really met, but they looked at each other and they said, Didn't we, weren't you at the UAW convention in 1948? And they both were, and they remembered each other, and then they were saying, and they both agreed on this, you know, we got the dues check off, and after that the stewards didn't have to come to us to get the dues, you know, which you could hold and make sure the steward was being responsive and the whole bureaucracy, and that's when the bureaucracy detached. Now, Janus, you know, that decision has ended the automatic dues checkoff. I think the unions that have survived uh, the best are the ones that are going to organize and be responsive to the rank and file. And I can tell you, you know, being in the Teamsters, there was no orientation for new workers at the UPS hub where I was. Uh, and, you know, these young kids who come in, they, to them the union was like an insurance policy. You pay your premiums and you get some benefits. You know, the, the union wasn't something you fight the employer with or... They, they don't even know how to file grievances anymore. It's really changed the culture there. And I can keep going on about that, but I'll stop. But uh, I think it's important to understand that what happened in this, that period after World War II was an exception. And otherwise, as capitalism has grown, the rate of exploitation has grown, the rich have got richer, and you know the system really just wants to give you enough to survive so you can come back and work another day and make some more money for the owners. And uh, that's the system. It's a system of exploitation just like slavery was or feudalism was. Yeah. Well, that's why I suggested the slogan Green New Deal back in 2010, because we can point out and appeal to those Democrats that the Democrats have never fulfilled the New Deal as FDR laid it out in full in his 1945 uh, State of the Union address where he called for a second Bill of Rights, an economic Bill of Rights. And those rights to employment or livable income a decent home, comprehensive health care, a good education, and some other things, but those are the ones probably most relevant in our context today, were put into Democratic platforms. And every Democrat from Truman to Obama had at least one two-year cycle where they had both house sides of Congress. They never got any of those realized. We don't have any of them. Civil rights movement picked that up and said, yes, but do it without discrimination in employment and education and housing. And so I see us picking that up, and now we got the climate crisis, makes it a Green New Deal. But I would argue politically that to get the climate action, 
from people that are concerned at, you know, closing down a power plant in their community, lose a tax base, people lose jobs, skeptical, you know, the jobs versus environment thing, to get those people on board for the, you know, really emergency mobilization we've got to have to deal with the climate crisis, we've got to make sure everybody's got their economic rights secured. In the same way, I believe that when the civil rights movement turned from civil rights to human rights, as they said, the black leadership of that movement said, the way we're going to stop this white backlash that's mounting in the mid-60s is to secure the economic rights for everybody. We got to champion, you know, the right to these same rights that Roosevelt articulated so that the white people get them too, and then they won't see us as competition and we'll secure our civil and political rights. So you got to build a broad political base. And I think, you know, what we say to those Democrats is, look, the Democratic Party talks, but don't do it. And, uh, you know, we really mean it. So I don't know if anybody wants to add. I think also, um, although some people do think that the Democratic Party is a friend to working people, I think most people in general just think that they're just politicians and liars like everyone else. And maybe they have some sort of idea, maybe that they're slightly like lesser of two evils. But I think that there's just like this huge swath of people who are just completely disengaged from politics and just feel like it's one bad thing after another. And those are the people that I think socialists should be engaging and being like, yes, you are right. Those people are against you. However, there there is another option. Because there's not really, I mean, in New York, yeah, there's committed Democrats, but usually when you, when you speak with people and you talk about anything from, you know, wage laws to health care, it's really actually kind of obvious how terrible the Democratic Party is. Many people don't really need that much uh, convincing, but pe what people do need convincing about is that there could be a possible another option. I feel like that's the real difficulty is that that it just seems like there's these two absolutely terrible options and that they're just the representatives of the capitalist class and what what is anybody else supposed to do? I mean, I almost don't even want to waste time talking to like a truly committed Democrat because they just, they if they can't see what's in front of their face, then it's almost not worth it. But I think that the real place to look is people who like most people already recognize the people in power in this country have absolutely uh, no qualms about repeatedly sc like screwing them over. Um, I guess I just want to touch on the, both of the two last questions a little bit. Uh, I feel like we need to come out more boldly and um, not just limit ourselves to kind of defensive measures, like I said earlier, because I think that's what the Democrats do. Um, it's, it's like these small reforms that sound like they're helping people, but don't really. And it's, it's for different sectors of the population, or it, it doesn't really help, doesn't speak to the real problem of people. That's why I guess I, I was starting my presentation just talking about hearkening back to our history and some, you know, revol you know, looking at this revolutionary past, like why, why the call for time, control of time was so critical. It doesn't just speak to the economics of different sectors of workers, but how can it unite all of us? Because time is our lives, what we do with our lives. And all of us seem, well, more and more of us seem to be struggling. And we don't have time to take part in meetings like this or whatever. You, you know, you're just struggling to survive. Um, and I guess I wanted to mention um, about the, the 70s and after, like, I, I really feel like, like I mentioned that the 80s were very key too around deregulation and all, but also this employer sanctions provision because it was particularly, it's been particularly um, a, a strong knife in, in dividing the working class and, and pitting workers against one another. So like Tanya earlier mentioned that a lot of people, a lot of Americans think citizens think that immigrants are taking my job 
or doing work or the other thing is doing work that Americans don't want to do. So if you have an employer sanctions provision that criminalizes workers, basically says those um, immigrants, those undocumented immigrants don't have rights, then that's why bosses pay $3.25 an hour and then can threaten the workers like, oh, I'll call ICE or whatever, especially nowadays if you complain. And then like what U.S. citizen worker is going to work as a busboy for three twenty-five an hour? Like, you know, most Americans are not going to take that job, right? And so why are the undocumented taking it? Because they're you know, they come here compared to where they're from, it's something, um, and uh, so it, it, it really divides, it divides uh, workers. And I see it also in organizing too. We've had so many instances, I mean, in our everyday work, where the workers in workplaces where there are immigrants, like undocumented immigrants and citizens working side by side, it's really difficult to be able to organize together because, for instance, we had one restaurant case where the, the Mexican indig the delivery workers, bicycle delivery workers, were working 12 hours a day for $15 an hour. So tips on top of that, but still, 50, it's like $1.25 an hour, that's what it amounted to. And so the Chinese documented workers doing delivery in their cars were paid $25 a day as opposed to the 15. When the Mexican workers decided to try organizing and we were working with them to organize, f fight for their old wages, they tried to talk to the Chinese workers, but the Chinese workers felt like, well, I'm making more than you guys. Why should I, you know? Uh, and then when the Chinese workers tried to talk to the boss about um, getting uh, increase in wages, they were told, why should I pay you more? I can get more Mexican workers and pay less. And when the Mexican workers had tried earlier to ask the boss for more money, he said, why should I pay you more? Because you don't have your own car, you don't have a car like those guys. Because the Chinese guys were paying for the gas and everything. So I mean, pitting them against one another like that. And also, even for unionizing perspective, it's uh, this this employer sanctions has made it really difficult because even though you can join a union if you're undocumented, when if you are fired for organizing, you can't you can't. Uh, get your job back because you're not supposed to be employed because you don't have papers. So this is how our system works, you know? So oh, even like when Trump is all uh, anti-immigrant, right? We have a lot of our Mexican members say their relatives are still crossing the border, sometimes paying as much as $9,000 to a coyote to come over here and go straight to work in the service industry here in New York. So people are still coming and it's as if, you know, our system, they kind of, it's kind of like pretending, to be, you know, but then needing, wanting the, you know, we're, we're like built on a slave economy just in a different form. Um, so that's why I just feel like that is a really, we've got to see how dangerous that law is because right now people are just looking at, you know, scapegoating one another. Um, yeah. Let me let me just make the usual disgusting plea for money before we get to Carmen. Uh, this room is costing us, I think, five hundred dollars between the speaking system and the rental. Is that correct, Jim? Yeah. So. You know, it's coming out of my campaign, and we're a very low budget, living off the land kind of campaign. So, um, if uh, Michael or Jim, somebody could get uh, something to pass around, and if people can throw a little bit in the in the hat or the box or whatever it is, uh, be greatly appreciated. And if you want to make a more serious donation, we have forms in the back, and we can certainly use them. And uh, 
So, you know, milk is, what do they call it? Money is the milk of politics, or mother's milk of politics is what Tip O'Neill used to say. It's true. So, anyway, Carmen. Okay, I'm the green up here, so I got to answer that one. So um, you, you're asking both how trade affects that and just generally how we create jobs. Um, well, in terms of that economic right to a job, uh, I think the greens have pretty much agreed that we, the government should be the employer last resort. If you can't get a job in the public sector, you go to the employment office, not the unemployment office, and say, I want my job like we did with the Works Progress Administration in the late 30s until I had 42 or so, maybe 43. And local communities, usually county, but in larger cities, the city, would uh, develop projects that uh, met community-defined needs. It could be physical infrastructure, it could be uh, social services. And then uh, the local locality would put in 10% of the cost of federal government, 90%. So the local government had some skin in the game. They weren't just getting it totally paid for by the federal government. So they wanted to make sure it gave them some incentive to make sure it worked right. But the federal government, being a central body that could fund this with progressive taxation, provided the funds. And there have been studies. There's a Princeton uh, economist um, whose name is escaping me right at the moment. He's written books on full employment, and uh, he's basically figured that if this was a permanent program, it almost pays for itself because the savings and safety net programs, uh, federal contribution to Medicaid, unemployment insurance, uh, SNAP, you know, food stamps, and so forth, the savings from providing jobs where people can pay, you know, for their own needs uh, makes it a program that is you know pays for itself so i think that's where we start in terms of bringing manufacturing back given our trade agreements i would just say and i think the greens haven't developed a well thought out trade policy it's a discussion we've got to have and i think the left has to have but um the key question is how uh we work across borders as workers and tariffs are not the central question protectionism versus quote unquote free markets. The problem with the trade agreements we've had is that they're run from the top down by the corporate interests, corporate managed trade. So if there's a trade dispute, the public isn't you know, involved, the unions aren't involved, it's just the corporations and the World Trade Organization or whatever the uh, tribunal is set up by that trade agreement. So it's you know the corporations and the, and the states, they're called state investor dispute uh, resolution tribunals. And so it's the elites like working out their own differences. The workers aren't part of it. So I think we need trade that uh, promotes balanced production everywhere. Um, and sometimes that involves tariffs to protect industries and sometimes it doesn't. I don't think that's the key question. The question is what's good for the workers and good for the workers across borders. If we, I, What I've seen is that like UAW, man, if you drive, if you parked in their parking lot with a so-called Korean or Japanese car, uh, you know, they'll scratch it up, key it, they might even puncture your tires. And that's just this nationalism where it's pitting American workers against Korean and Japanese workers. And when the workers are divided, the bosses win. So I think we got to avoid that kind of uh, nationalistic protectionism. We got to be internationalist. But that's not a question of tariffs or not. I think it, the tariffs depends on in the worker's interest or the boss's interest. So I don't know if that answers the question to your satisfaction, but that's the best I got. I, mean, the, I do think that it's, it's definitely important to uh, stay away from uh, the nationalism that uh, dominates 
domestic politics because it's very dangerous and the, the left also engages in it sometimes. And, you know, I'm happy to hear you, you know, say that it's, it's when the workers are divided, the bosses win. And when people start talking about, you know, uh, privileging one, one group of workers over another group of workers, it just, it, it does nothing to really raise class consciousness. It just uh, creates xenophobia and class divisions. Great. Um, <laughs> I was just going to say real quick about job creation in response um, to the last question. Oh, well, one is, I guess I spoke to the, like, if we can get control of time and those overworked to be, you know, be able to not have to work so many hours, that would open up some time, some employment for those who are unemployed, underemployed. I also feel like there's um, a lot of work that people are doing that they're not paid for, like caregiving for your family. And so it seems like as a society, we should recognize that too and pay or support it just to give people more of an option if that's what people decide they want to do to get some support. So whether it's caring for your children or your elderly parents or whatever, like we don't have much support for that. Um, the other thing is like in organizing, like if your workplace or whatever, like there are, there are sometimes instances where you can hold the, um, the company accountable for what work it gives um, to the workers here. Like for instance, again, when we were organizing garment, I mean, I remember one of the demands of, of Donna Karen, of DKNY, that the garment workers made was not just about paying the back wages and uh, improving the conditions, but also that she commit a certain percentage of her work to stay in this country, to the, like accountable to the workers who are working here. That didn't work. I mean, that, that she, didn't, <laughs> she didn't agree to that one. But I guess it was just an example, like when we're organizing, what, what can we demand? How, what do we want to hold them accountable for? It's just one little piece, I guess. Um, this discussion reminds me of a slogan I saw the Green Party of Germany adopt uh, in 1984. They, you know, they just got into the Bundestag and you know, people all over the world were looking at them and then they're their eco-socialists in Hamburg were the principal authors of the economic program they finally adopted. And they had a section on a fair distribution of uh, work and income, which had to do with time. So this, the economy becomes more productive. We can all work less, but we don't want to uh, get less income. So how do you 
create, how do you share that surplus when we're not all working? And um, there's a guy named Andre Gortz who's passed on now, but he wrote a lot about that in the, I guess in the 90s and, uh, and really in the 80s and 90s, because that was a big topic over there in Europe. And I think that's something we need to look at. Um, so I, that, I think, is a problem we need to solve and have a good proposal for so that uh, if we go, as the old slogan used to say, 30 hours work for 40 hours pay, well, you can't take it out of each company. Um, you need to have some way of socializing the, the distribution of that surplus so that it's a second income, you know, like a citizen's dividend. That's the way Gortz was trying to, you know, frame it. And you can go back and read South End Press published some of his books, and there's others. Uh, Verso, I think, had one of his later books. But anyway, and the economist whose name I forgot that is a full employment economist at Princeton is named Philip Harvey. I still don't remember the title of the book, but it's about full employment. But I, I didn't want to, and I'm, I'm seeing the referee. It's time. So yes, uh, we're running, okay, it's 8.57. We have the room until 9. So I guess it's a good time to wrap up. I appreciate everybody coming. Remember, next week we're going to be here talking about education. Huge issue. Uh, we've got the most segregated schools in the country. We've got this high-stakes testing. They're using to justify privatization. And Cuomo isn't funding the schools like the courts said the state should out of the campaign for fiscal equity case and says a bunch of nonsense about, well, he increases it every year and we spend more per capita, not accounting for the distribution, high poverty districts. There's a lot to talk about. My running mate uh, will be speaking, Gia Lee, who is a public school teacher at the Earth uh, School here in New York City. But, you know, besides being a teacher and a chapter leader in the UFT and the one that the Moore Caucus Movement of Rank and File Educators ran against Michael Mulgrew and she got 20% a couple years ago for UFT president. She's been involved in the background helping these workers in the right to work states, you know, Kentucky, West Virginia, Oklahoma, uh, pull off those successful strikes that, that advance the cause of both the teachers and the students to get the schools funded. Just spent a week in Puerto Rico working with the Teachers Federation down there because DeVos and Trump want to privatize the whole system and the disaster capitalism in the wake of uh, Hurricane Maria. So you got to come in here, Gia Lee, next week. And uh, we'll get uh, better publicity out than we got for this one. And uh, just to mention the other dates, uh, we have, do we have any flyers in the back uh, that have those dates? Okay. And we're going to get a Facebook page up with the whole schedule. And uh, just to mention, so that's next week. And then the next one is October 16th. That's scheduled now. Uh, that's about the problem of segregation. Uh, we got Margaret Kimberly talking about the politics, both black and white politicians, why they don't want to touch it. Uh, she's from Black Agenda Report. Michael Sussman, our attorney general candidate, who is uh, basically, you put his resume up against all the other candidates, all the Democrats around the primary, the Republican. His resume dwarfs them. Hundreds of cases in state and federal court. Landmark cases like the Yonkers desegregation case. If you saw uh, Show Me a Hero, that HBO miniseries, he's the lawyer featured in it because he led that fight. Uh, you got a $45 million settlement for black and Latino workers discriminated against by the civil service tests and promotion process. Police brutality, public corruption, environment. This guy does it all. And uh, he's independent enough that he'll investigate Cuomo as well as Trump. And so that's on uh, October 16th. October 17th, we're going to do health care. That's in the Bronx. And then housing on October 22nd. We'll have uh, people from different housing groups around the city, including people that I think Joanne works with in the Citywide Anti-Displacement Coalition. And uh, so I hope you all will come and bring more folks and we'll continue this discussion of socialist solutions to pressing problems. Thank you.